Uh, hey, I'm Rick Mason, uh, uh, the uh, Mid-Michigan Sea Fug. We're glad to have all the uh, visitors today uh, here and around the world. Um, we're going to have a meeting here shortly. I did want to mention, and we were talking about him earlier, that next month uh, we're going to have Ray Camden, and he's going to be talking about the, uh, the jam stack. And Ray is a uh, great speaker, and as I mentioned earlier when we were privately chalking, uh, he is back working for Adobe this time in the document uh, division, former CF evangelist. Um, so, Randy, uh, go ahead and take it. If you're ready. Let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint. I'll be doing this presentation in tandem with my colleague, Daniel. Daniel is, I think this year, a sophomore, right, Daniel? Uh, I'm a junior. Oh, junior. So Daniel comes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Flies fast. Well, you can tell about yourself, Daniel. Tell us, you know, who you yeah. are, where you came from, how you end up underneath me. Uh, yeah, like yep, yep. Okay, so my name is Daniel uh, Adijan. Uh, I lived my first 18 years in Ghana. And I came to MSU in 2018 to study uh, computer science. Yeah. So I've been here for three years. Yeah. And I started working with Randy um, in my second semester once I got to MSU. Yeah. So I've been with him uh, for almost two years now. Yeah. And it's been an exciting journey. <laughs> yeah. Daniel took a little break from us after we launched this Color ID Plus application, which we'll talk about later. And then he mm -hmm. did some work for Quicken, I think, for a few months. And then he came back to work for us because we're better. Yeah. No, <laughs> the internship ended. <laughs> Let me queue up my PowerPoint. Make sure I get the right one. I guess I better start this because Betsy's in the room. Uh, I'm not a Microsoft guy, so we'll just go there. I'm not a Microsoft guy, so this information, take it at will. So Daniel did his introduction. Pretty much everybody knows me. I'm Randy Brown, Director of Web Solutions at University Advancement, Michigan State University. I work in an interesting unit that uh, has a lot of interesting problems because we deal with a lot of alumni and donors. And you wouldn't think it'd be a lot of problems or interesting situations, but it is. We don't have a sexy product but we have a interesting job of keeping relationships with alumni and donors, you know, really tight. So we'll start this presentation off because I like to take the Hal Helms road. That's a blast from the past, right? What are you gonna learn in this? Cause I don't want you sitting there bored, Betsy. Like, okay, just get to the good stuff, Randy. I don't wanna be bored out of my mind. I get you, we'll try to speed through this. So these are things you're going to learn, how to create a Microsoft developer account. Of course, this presentation will be available later. Um, you know, navigate Azure a little bit, and that right there is a monster. I'm pretty sure Betsy can attest to that. And then uh, build a manifest in Microsoft Teams App Studio to deploy on the Teams platform. And uh, this will be a one-way bot that we're going to build. We want to start working on a two-way bot, but that's uh, like further down the road. <clears throat> and then we'll show you how to de deploy this in your organization and show you the examples that we've built. So we're gonna pretty much gonna build one like right in front of you. We've already done a bunch of the pre-work. This slide is yours, Daniel. <laughs> it got me, yeah. So uh, we've got some tools that uh, we will need, uh, you know, to get everything done. First, you need an an HTML code editor, which is just any editor. If you want, uh, uh, I don't know, like word editor or like, you know, any simple text editor works fine. So far as you're able to code with it. We also need a web server. The most common ones, I think IIS, IIS and Apache. And we also need a web application server. And for our instance, that would be called Fusion. We also need a database server. Those are the examples, Microsoft SQL and uh, Oracle. We also need to create a developer account or a subscription and also um, a tenant, yeah. So the example that we have shown, like Brown RA at MSU UADV test. 
So the MSC UADV test will be uh, the tenant's name that we have. And since it's you know, a developer subscription, it'll automatically be hosted on that uh, domain on Microsoft.com, yeah. We also need a Microsoft Teams desktop client application. Uh, that is much more fluid working with, you know, uh, Teams instead of using the browser client, yeah. Okay, we also need uh, App Studio, which is an application inside of Teams, just like the one we are going to build. But then that one provides an interface for you to, you know, build your own applications. We also need a valid credit card. Yeah, just to identify yourself, but uh, most of the services that we are going to be using are free. So, you know, you shouldn't worry about getting charged or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me jump in real quick and explain the problem that we're going to try to solve by building a one way Teams bot. Most of the folks that work at MSU know we get paid once a month. So it's kind of weird. But then I have uh, bi weekly people who are in the CTU union or 1885 that get paid bi weekly. And I always forget, like, oh, I got to lock Daniel's time so he can get paid. There's been a few times where I had to like rush his check, like, yeah, Daniel, I get paid once a month. You get paid two or three times in a month. Sorry, I forgot that. So we thought we would just like use that as like our example. We couldn't think of anything else like better. I mean, we came with other stuff. We just wanted something really simple. This should be about, I don't know, 20 lines of like cold fusion. So we could jump in here real quick. So that's our task. That's, that's our problem. Our task is we're going to solve it with a bot that's going to remind me two days before the time is due so that Daniel doesn't have to. So I think selfishly, Daniel wanted to do this so that I wouldn't forget to, you know, make sure he gets paid. Daniel, this one's you. Yep. So uh, first of all, we have, to, we have to create an HTTPS endpoint, which would just be a cool fusion, you know, that's CFM. That'll be, uh, you know, the endpoint where Teams sends, you know, data to hit your server. Yeah, so, um, we also have to create, uh, you know, for the example that uh, Randy described, uh, MSU posts um, like information about our payroll. It contains the dates and uh, due dates and when we get paid and all of that. So we have to convert that data into a JSON object and, you know, store it on our server so we can reference it and, you know, get the information, do whatever computations that we want to do with it. Uh, yeah, so the next step will be to create a schedule job that'll uh, run that script. That is the CFM that we create, uh, like every day around, let's say, 8 a.m. And when that script runs, it'll check to see if uh, the number of dates till, you know, the approval is due is two or less. So if it's two, then it'll, you know, post the message to the team's application of the supervisor. Yeah. So the image that we have on the, yeah, the image that we have on the right is a sample index of CFM. The first thing that it does is it gets the request body, which was sent by teams. It checks uh, if, uh, the request was sent by Teams. In this case, I'm only checking for whether it was a post or a GET request. So if it's a post, we could assume it's coming from Teams, but then in a production setting, you would have to do more um, validation of that request just to make sure someone is not, you know, trying to intrude, yeah. And this is also, in our case, we are using the same script for the schedule job. So um, when the request comes in, if it is a post, then as of now, we are just assuming it's coming from Teams. But then if it is not a post, just a GET request, then that will be the schedule job. So we have this run URL, uh, run schedule. That is just a URL parameter to tell if we really want to run the schedule or not, because there are some bots that you know scan web pages. And if they hit on that web page, then that means that schedule is going to run. So we don't want that happening. So I just added this run schedule URL parameter to check 
that we indeed want to run the schedule. And the code that I have next is just to create, you know, a CFC that takes care of getting the date difference between the current date and the upcoming time due date. So if that time, that is if that time difference is two or less, then uh, we send the message, you know, to the team's application and that is on line 38, if it's visible enough for you guys, yeah. And also we have um, a set of users that for this instance or, you know, for our application, I'm just storing their credentials in the application scope. But in a, in a production setting, you would want to store those credentials somewhere secured in a database, yeah. But for our purposes, I'm just using the application scope to hold credentials that are needed to send a message to, you know, the team's application of whoever is the end user of the app. Yep. Randy, you could proceed. Okay. So um, this is where we get to, you know, the steps that you have to take to create, you know, the application. The first thing is you have to have uh, a Microsoft developer subscription. And this subscription has to be tied to a Microsoft account that you already have. So that could be, you know, any email account that you've, you know, registered an account with Microsoft with. And it could also be um, an email that you got from your organization. If the organization uses uh, Microsoft's Active Directory. Yep. Okay, so we provided a link to, you know, create that subscription and tie it to your Microsoft account. Okay, so once we've had that subscription created, that means uh, the name of the subscription actually is E5 something, yeah. And that one gives you access to literally, we could, we could say the Microsoft ecosystem, you get access to Teams and Outlook and, you know, all their products. So one thing that is most useful to us in this presentation will be the admin portal inside of uh, your tenants. So you could log into office.com and there is a section where you can you know click on to go to the admin portal and there we are going to do some configurations for the entire organization's teams application the first thing that we have to do is to enable upload custom apps which is shown in red in the image that we've provided yeah by default it's turned off so we'll have to turn that on and that enables uh, as to directly upload an app into our organization's app catalog right from our Teams application. So for most organizations, you know, in a production setting, they will oftentimes disable that because they don't want people just uploading whatever apps that they create to the organization's catalog. That will be uh, catastrophic, yeah, in case, you know, they don't go by security, yeah, strongly, yep. So, for our case, which is just testing, we can turn that on. Yep. Next slide. I say this slide is the most important thing because you have to understand like how this cloud is like put together. Daniel tried to draw a diagram. We tried puzzle pieces and everything else, and I I still couldn't find the diagram that totally depict like what the heck is going on and how this stuff like connects. Besides, you know. You have the Azure Cloud and all of its like resources, which is a bunch of stuff that you can like link to. So you have the outer box, which is pretty much an Azure AD tenant, which we all experienced yesterday. If you got an Office 365 account that had issues yesterday, maybe Betsy Weber can, you know, tell us like what really happened. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no I, don't, I don't know. We were getting nervous yesterday, like four o'clock. We we're like testing and like, hey. None's working on Azure. I can't even get into Azure. Well, the, you know, the AD stuff's not working. Anyways, I guess that's the glue that holds all this together. And then you have like uh, the 
Azure subscription, and I'll talk about that a little bit later after this slide, pretty much like, you know, Microsoft wants to get paid. I got to put this credit card on file. They're getting about as bad as Google. Give me that credit card just in case. You know, that's all I need is students writing code that with some runaway loop that all of a sudden just runs my bill up through the roof. And that has happened in our unit before, right, Daniel? Not Daniel, per se, <laughs> his predecessor. You know, he was on his way about getting fired. Like, look, man, you just cost me like, you know, three, four hundred bucks <laughs> because of something crazy. But anyway, that's a whole different story. And then you got like the Azure grouping, which is this box right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, which then also contains like the bot channels registration. So it's kind of like, and when I go through the slides later, I'll probably compare it because Microsoft has this whole like, you know, organization tenant approach. It just reminds me of like, you know, my first apartment that I got. So I'll probably make reference back to things like that. And then we got like the uh, Microsoft Azure bot channels registration. Nope, I just talked about that one. Sorry, we got the registration and the grouping. So I think I covered all of them. Let me move to my next slide. So first thing you want to do after you get your Office 365 developer account created, which has to link to an account at Microsoft, but that's a whole different like conversation. It's the same credentials that I'm using like right here, Brown Area MSU UADV test. And I log into um, Azure and I'll have uh, access to all this like great stuff. So once I get in there, of course, you know, Microsoft wants to know how are we going to get paid? Let me get my credit card out. Let me go ahead and set up set up a subscription. A subscription can be linked to like any like resource up there. And we had some experiences as far as like deploying our first app with uh, MSU and that uh, resource and or that subscription and getting charged. Of course, we recommend using a free trial offer because like Daniel said, you know, if you're just testing, you're not going to go over like 10,000 messages. You know, it's just not going to happen. I mean, if it does, I guess good for you because you're developing something that a lot of people want. <laughs> so if you look for this icon when you're inside Azure, the little key down there that says uh, subscriptions, that's what I'm referring to. As you can see, once you click the add button, that's how you create it. I already created mine in there, so we didn't want to waste time in this presentation doing it. We call it Azure Subscription 1. So now I got my like subscription set up. Now I got to link it to uh, an Azure resource group. So, like I said earlier, this is just a logical container, kind of like the whole thing is because you can have different resource groups up there. Like right now, we have our Crawl ID Plus application deployed at MSU. We probably want that into own resource group, independent of our like event one that we want to work on. So, next slide. Now, this one's very important. The Azure like app registration. You're pretty much. I mean, I would make this like probably synonymous to like you know you sign in like that that lease saying okay this is what i'm doing up here this is the stuff that links to it this is how you're going to get paid is linked to my subscription all that great stuff and the key thing to note here is that you know when you're creating this thing they're going to give you like i think three uh guids one will be an application id this huge long thing you might want to put that in notepad because you're going to need about two or three times later and then very important in the red, make sure you select accounts in the organizational directory and personal Microsoft accounts or else it just won't work <laughs> in our situation, the way we have things set up. So next slide. We're going to go ahead and create that uh, secret inside of the Microsoft Azure app registration. You can do uh, Microsoft recommends that you use like a certificate. In this demo, we just use the username, password, the secret approach. So we're going to use the application secret, which it'll just generate for you. And this is another thing that I recommend that you just like copy and put in notepad because you're going to need it later down the road when you're setting this up. And all this goes pretty like, you know, fairly quick. We just didn't want to do it like right in front of you. So we did a few screen grabs where things are. And then I try to like put in the presentation like, I mean, that's the closest I could get to a direct link to get to this the azure bot channels registration yep oh I read that slide so you are looking at that slide. okay great yep. so that's where you select like the pricing model that you want in this case like we said earlier select the free one and this is where you tell it like your endpoint is going to be like on our cold fusion server <clears throat> 
like this is where we want messages like sent or a message will be coming from this to teams and back and forth. So like I said earlier, you're going to need that client ID. You'll take that out of notepad, you know, cut and paste and all that great stuff. So now moving to slide 15. So upon like, you know, successful like completion of that, now you're going to configure it to talk to like Microsoft Teams. And if you notice from the slide, if you look down, you can also link this to like an Alexa. I got a show around here that we're going to try to connect this to later in the future. You also could connect it to like a Facebook channel. But in this situation, we're going to keep it simple. It's just going to be like uh, Teams going or Teams, our server to Teams and back and forth. So next slide is 16. I think this one might be yours. Uh, yep. Let me see. yep, that one's yours, Daniel. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, as of now, we've completed all the setup that we have to do in Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud. Yeah. So the next step is to log into the Teams application of the tenant that we just created. So in there, we could we have some three dots. I hope it's clear enough for all of us in the image that we added yeah so once you click on the three dots you can search for app studio and once you find it you could add it to your teams application that is you could install it by clicking on the ad if it is not already installed in there yeah yeah next slide can i okay yeah so um once we have the app studio installed, we have to create a manifest, which is just uh, a JSON file that contains declarations or information about the bot that we want to deploy to teams. Yeah, so um, you could, you know, write a JSON file with all those fields and values, but then app studio provides uh, a very convenient way to, um, you know, pull in all that data, like put them together. So instead of App Studio, you click on the Manifest Editor tab, which is shown highlighted in the image. Yeah, and in there we have uh, some fields that we have to, you know, fill out. First is the name of the app, the full name of the app, and the identification, which is the app ID. So in our case, we've already created the app IDs and all of that in Azure. So we could literally just copy those app IDs and paste them in here. And uh, we don't have to click on the click on the generate button because that'll generate a new app ID for you. But we've already done that, so you can just copy that, then paste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Can I change it myself? Or? Yeah, you can okay. absolutely change it yourself. Okay. You do better me, yeah. Danny. At least you can see it. All I see <laughs> is slide 13. <laughs> uh, okay. So now that we have all of that done, I think, yeah. So back to uh, the previous slide. Um, on the left pane, we have uh, details, and under that, we have the app details. So that is the, uh, I would say, parent details of the manifest. And we also have the capabilities and listed there are tabs, bots, connectors, messaging extensions. Yeah, so all of those are uh, like cool things that you can build inside of Teams. But then our focus for today will be building bots. Yeah. So go back to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so actually, there's a button that says, um... Uh, take control and then you can go and control it from there. Oh, okay. I along see. the top. Yeah. Hmm. I cancel. Well, okay. So, I think I fast forwarded. Uh, uh, we all can see uh, the image with set up a bot, right? Can we see that image? Set up a bot. Yep, you're good. Okay, cool. So uh, 
we get to this point by clicking on the but, uh, button inside of the capabilities section in the previous slide. So in there we have new but and existing but. Since we've done the but channels registration inside of Azure, our but is already configured. So we go to existing buts and we select connect to a different but ID. We then pass in uh, the app ID that we already have. Uh, did we go back to the first slide or is it just me? I messed that up, Daniel. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I will start Different saying one. that again. Apologize yeah. about that, guys. Okay, Daniel, looks like you're going to have to display it because I was saying I can't display content. Uh, okay. So... Uh, can we see the setup a bot? Oh, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, we selected a connect to a different bot ID, and the reason we did that was currently we've not built any bots using App Studio, so we don't have any existing bots to select from. But then once we connect to a different bot, it actually pulls that information from Azure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the next section is where we uh, state if the bot is one way or it supports uploading and downloading multiple files, like uploading and downloading files. So in our case, uh, we are not using that functionality. The bot cannot upload and download files. If you want to, you know, play around with it or build something much more complex, you could select that. And uh, the one-way notification bots is just a one-way conversation between uh, our code and the end user of the bot. So the end user cannot message the bot, but then we could provide a way for them to interact with the bot using links or buttons and yeah, all of that. But then there is no text box for them to put in some random information to text the bot, yeah. So if you don't select that uh, that checkbox, then you can, it is a two-way bot then? Yep, yep. If you don't okay. select that, then you can text the bot, just like a, uh, a user, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next section is calling the bot. So yeah, there is also a functionality to allow your bot to support uh, video calls and audio calls. But yeah, that is beyond the scope of this. And the last section describes the scope that we want the bot to have access to. So personal, which is selected here, means that the bot is able to communicate one-on-one -on -one with a user. If we had selected Teams also, that is Team, then the bot will be able to be part of a channel inside of Microsoft Teams. Yeah, so it could, you know, put in, you know, some information in their channel and respond to messages from, you know, all people included in that channel. We could also have a group chat, which is pretty similar to a channel, but then it is, uh, it is not in itself a team. It's just some small number of people that come together to form that group, and you could also select that if you want your bot to have access to that uh, scope. But in our case, we're just going with personal. That is one-to-one -one conversation with a single user. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so at this point, uh, we've done all the configurations that we need for our bot to be used inside of Teams application. The next thing to do is to test and distribute. And uh, they provide three options. The first one is to install your bot just right inside of the Teams application that you're working with without uh, uploading it for the entire organization. And that functionality comes as a result of the settings that we did in uh, the admin for Teams. Yeah. We also could download the manifest that we've just created 
so that uh, in a production setting, like not everyone has access to the Teams admin, which is, you know, office.com admin. So one thing that like for us, we currently do is once we've created the manifest, we just download it and send it to people who have access to that admin uh, portal for them to upload. So uh, since this is, uh, you know, a development environment, we have access to all of that and you could choose to download and upload if you want, but that is not uh, what we'll be doing today. Yep. You could also publish, but you'll just publish it directly to your uh, Teams app catalog without having to download and, you know, give it off to someone else who has access to upload it. You could publish that right by yourself. And that is also provided by uh, the functionality that we toggled inside of the admin portal that is upload custom apps. Yeah. So once you have that set, you can do the install and the publish. Yeah. Okay. So um, we will have to know if someone installs our bot in their Teams application. Currently, from the previous slide, when we hit install, that is, we add the bot to our own application. That is our own Teams application. So uh, Teams send out uh, an HTTPS message, an HTTP message, yeah, to our server, and that contains uh, like a request body, just a post uh, request. And inside of that, there are some informations. There are some information that are available for us. I don't know if the screenshot that I put is really visible, but we have the channel data. And we also have the channel ID, which tells us tells us where the request is coming from. So in our case, the channel ID is Microsoft Teams. That is MS Teams telling us that the event uh, originated from a Teams application. We also have a conversation section, which contains an ID that we can cache or store somewhere and use it to send new messages to the same place where it originated from. So let's say if a user installs the bot, we first get uh, the conversation ID that is generated for conversations with that user. So whenever you want to message that user, you have to use that conversation ID. It also contains um, uh, the ID of the bot, which is just uh, our app ID prepended with 28 colon. Yeah. So Daniel. James asked a question regarding, uh, is this what is in the post? And I said, yes. And also yeah. in this case, that conversation idea is how we tie it to like our different users around the office. And we're going to show you our crawl ID plus app that we worked with, with Nick's department on later. That's how we know who to communicate to. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So every message that we send, we'll be using that conversation ID to identify the specific user that we want to send that to. Yeah, we also have a user ID that is also used to identify the user. So when sending uh, a message, you have to add both the user ID and the conversation ID. Let's say if we lose the conversation ID, there is an endpoint in their API to head to set up a new conversation that gives you a new you know, conversation ID. But then since it like a conversation ID is created whenever they install the bot, we don't have to go through, you know, the extra step to set up a conversation by hitting another endpoint. You can just cache the value. But if we lose it, we have to hit the API to get a new one. Yeah. So I think the next section, Daniel, you want me to just share my uh, browser so they can see like uh this bot that you created, payroll schedule and action? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
and take control. Oh, no, don't need to do that. You can do this. And we'll just make this full screen. Sorry, guys. I thought I had everything arranged here. So I apologize. <laughs> so, like Daniel said, that payroll reminder or schedule bot that we created, I've already installed it by going down to the three dots. Right now, it will only talk to Daniel or myself. And that's because we only have conversation IDs for us two because we've installed those apps. And upon installing, that's how it communicated back to us like, hey, somebody just got this and here's their conversation ID. We take the information and store it. In this case, he just stuck it directly probably in the application scope and that's where it sits right now. Mm -hmm. So if Daniel were to run this and we're just gonna pretend like it's, I don't know, 8 a.m. the next day or this morning, if he runs it, then I should get a message from that bot. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm gonna pull up my browser and just run it real quick. Yeah. Um, and I'm running Teams in my <laughs> browser, not my client. And I'm logged into that developer account. Um, payroll. Uh, one second here, Randy. <laughs> that put you in the spot, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just the URL, you know. Uh, Cut and paste out of the presentation, Daniel. I'll check the chat, make sure there's no other questions. Anybody got any questions while he's typing? Just go ahead and fire them out there. Sorry, I'll have to talk to Betsy later regarding my teams not going past, like, slide 13. I thought that was quite interesting. I had to totally shut down teams, restart it. <laughs> So that was, maybe they have more problems with Azure. Betsy throws me a smile. Thanks, Betsy. Yeah, so Randy, I run it. Yep, I see it right there, 745. It's saying two days remaining. Me being fussy the way I am, I would have went back to you, Daniel. It's like, what is this like? I mean, it's great you got it working with Teams, but I need to look a heck of a lot better than that, even though it's just coming to me. And that's what happened like in our situation. I've been kicking this caller ID plus application idea to Nick for, oh my God, like five years. And it started out on so many platforms and it started out in email and teams with the pandemic and everything. That was like the right combination of things. So also in the chat, Daniel, James has a question. So does the tenant, does the Teams bot pull the CFM endpoint with the JSON post and the CF endpoint respond? I presume with a JSON body containing the message to send. Yep. So I don't know if I could share the code or something, but yeah. You can share it. Okay. Let me uh, look at the screen. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. So uh, I hope you guys can see my screen. Can you increase it? Uh, yeah. Oops, I went too far. Let me just close the terminal. Yeah, so in here we get uh, the request coming from Teams. But in this case, since I run, uh, I run that endpoint, it was actually a get request to uh, our endpoint. That is this URL. And in there, since it's not a post request, that means we just filter it that it's not coming from Teams. And we create these objects. And in here, as you can see, we are doing but that send message. And that is a method that is configured in uh, this object. And it accepts a message, as you can see right here. It is the date difference between the current date and the time due date, which is shown in uh, this JSON. Uh, 
So today is I think uh yeah. So three five three nineteen. That is the next uh due date for approval. So we check the difference between today's date and that date and then post that to Teams as the message through this uh, line of code. Yep. Yep, Randy, you could proceed. Well, I hope that made sense though. Yeah. That made sense, Daniel, but I left off when we switched to the code how that you can make this look better. And I can show people real quick what you can do with Teams and JSON and uh, your project you have on like GitHub regarding uh, adaptive cards and Cold Fusion. Right, yeah. So currently the message that we sent to Randy was raw text, but then uh, Teams provides a way to send a much more structured and visually appealing, uh, let's say UI using adaptive cards. Yeah, like the one he's highlighted, yeah. So that format looks different from, uh, you know, the, uh, the ones after that, yeah. yeah. And it's pretty simple to like, but Daniel, I don't wanna know if I wanna go back to his code, but like you say, he just calls that CFC why don't you jump back to it, Daniel? So you can change that yeah. to adapt. You should just be able to uncomment it, send me yep. an adapt the request. Mm -mm. <laughs> Wrong screen, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So um, we can uncomment this line. Jeez, uh, I commented again. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, VS code. Yeah, there you go. But then inside of this loop, I'm going through the users that we have in the application scope, which is Randy and I. So I'll have to first create this on top of the loop. Then call this uh right here in place of that yeah so what this code is doing is it is creating the adaptive card and adding uh, a bunch of sections to it like a container and a text block yeah it's all described in uh, a resource that will be adding to the slide so and in here we just call convert to adaptive card for the submitted in that in that object and pass that to send message. So if I run that, uh, uh, Randy, did you receive? Yeah, I'm gonna show it. Okay. So Daniel just fired it off. He changed the code to adaptive. And like you said, we have a link at the end of the presentation to like uh, Microsoft where they talk about a bunch of adaptive cards and you can get like crazy as far as what you want to do. Now, the key thing to remember in this case, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, your number you have to pay attention to is they're not going to let a card or a message go over 24K. 24 yep. is 42K. I think 24, 28. Yeah. So that's going to yeah determine like how much you can ship back and really make you think about what you're going to ship back because we had that same situation where we're like oh we're sending too much data and it's not friendly i mean we were able to trap it and like oh okay i see what happened we went over the limit <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it gets really interesting as far as shipping data back and forth so i think our next section daniel we're going to move and we got like uh i think eight slides left we're going to talk about the project that we built with uh, the Teams bot. It's a one-way bot. We call it Caller ID Plus. We work with Nick Kwiatkowski's like unit to get that set up so that whenever my phone rings, and I think I can share that. Whoops. Let me see if I can get back to that. 
So pretty much whenever somebody's phone rings in UA, let me stop sharing that. And let me go to my PowerPoint. A message gets sent to that development officer via team saying, hey, Nick Kwiatkowski just called you. Here's a brief dossier regarding like, you know, who he is, you know, how much money he's given to the university, what his affinity level is and all that good stuff. And here's a sample of it right there. Hopefully you can see it on my screen in PowerPoint. So that's a dossier right there that will show up in Teams. So pretty much, and I'll show you the diagram of like what happens. So in this situation, the donor calls from their cell phone. It hits Nick's server because he manages like all the phone systems on campus. And it like splits that message. It sends half of it or it sends a message to our servers, which is connected to Teams as an endpoint, and then also sends it to that development officer's phone. So their phone's gonna start ringing, their teams are gonna pop up, and actually this has saved me a few times, especially being working from home where I was like not too happy early morning and getting a call from a donor, but because it showed up in my teams, I knew it was a donor. So I was like, whoa, it's either a salesman calling me or a donor. In this case, it was a donor because it popped up and it showed me all the information, and they'll send it right to that person's uh, in this case, we have a desktop, but if you have Teams on your phone, and that's another thing we didn't really highlight, is that Teams can be installed on your phone, iOS or Android, and it would pop up there too. And even on my, I think my watch too, it shows up. So that's how we rig this. We talked to the next team and said, hey, whenever a call comes in to like some number that is subscribed to your system, you know, send it to our caller ID plus app if that person's like, you know, signed up. And we had that conversation ID. So that's what's happening in that situation. Uh, I don't think we're gonna go much into this one. This is talking about the subscription. This is kind of like, I think what Nick was asking about, like, well, how do I know who I'm talking to? Once we get that conversation ID, even after you unsubscribe from our call ID application, if we still have that conversation ID, we still pretty much could talk to you. And then the next one, we're gonna skip that one, Daniel. I'm gonna go to the actual application and show them what's happening there. So let me stop sharing this. And I think start. a question came in from Nick that did we create our own adaptive card component or that was from Microsoft? Uh, That'd be so, your question, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> uh, Microsoft did, like, it just provides uh, a JSON schema of how an adaptive card is supposed to behave. And uh, we thought it would be helpful to create uh, some kind of a model or package that allows us to seamlessly work with adaptive cards. Because like the, with the complexity of color ID, it'll be difficult to, you know, create a J, like a struct in cold fusion, just to hold all of that information, uh, yeah in the application. So we just decided to create objects and, you know, have the objects, you know, uh, using, you know, object oriented programming concepts, just uh, generate that card when we call a method in, yeah, the card objects. So that was something that we built ourselves, it wasn't provided by uh, Microsoft. Yeah. And so, we've also included that in uh, the GitHub code sample, which we'll get back to. Why don't you simulate a phone call to caller ID plus in the lab so they can see like what will happen in the case, you know, if my phone were the ring. So while you're getting that set up, I'll kind of like walk down through this card. This is our newer card, so it's a little different. We're making it so that a development officer could then, you know, I don't know, find a picture and put it in there of like Nick Kwiatkowski or whoever. It would also give you like spouse information, who their manager is, where they live. We build in this like process too. I think that works with ArcGIS where you can also click that and it'll go fetch like the home value. So you could see like, oh, okay, this guy lives in like a million dollar home or whatever have you. Uh, in the new version, we got like more information because we're worried about that. We encapsulate into like an adaptive card band. So you can see what company this person works for, you know, their capacity, you know, they're, they're six, so they're 50,000, but they're one. It shows also their affinity, their stage, uh, total lifetime giving. Of course, these ages are fake, and that was one of our hard issues we had to do is like wire up some fake data to like our lab. So another cool thing, 
happens. So another cool thing is like the giving summary, because then you'll see like really what they have an affinity for. Obviously, this person has a real affinity for WKR TV. They must watch a lot of it. Uh, they like going to Wharton. They've given $1,800 to them. And WKR. So this was a card that I loaded up earlier. So all that data is like wrapped in that card. Let's say, for instance, if I wanted to see more like donations, and it treats it just like a conversation. So if I click show more, it's going to put this at the bottom of the stack and see how it's saying new messages. So I get down there. That's showing me that person all there, like when they gave that money, how long ago it was. You know, we got pagination built in there. So it just replaces that card in that case. And you can do like some crazy stuff. Daniel, I don't know if you had a chance to like, uh, this is also something like, it was probably like an anti uh, pattern, but we made it so that I could clean this up. So if I want to get rid of cards and start deleting the conversation, but nobody really does that. I mean, think about text messaging. Nobody goes back through and start, you know, deleting portions of the conversation. They just let it keep running. So were you able to simulate a call to me, Daniel? Oh, yeah, I've not clicked on the call button yet. Okay. Uh, I just did, so. So I don't know if you noticed that it was pretty fast. So you called me from <laughs> Shelly Easton. I was just looking at her, right? Yep. Okay, yeah. so Shelly just called me from there. So then, like, from a foster standpoint, I could click contact. I could click this button and use also some other programming that Nick's unit has developed to actually make a call from my computer and link it back to my office phone. So they'll never know my cell phone number. We'll just like make the bridge and make the connection. Of course, we want to work on this record and transcribe. <laughs> it's also showing like call history. I mean, Daniel just like found her today. So he called me a lot from her number, you know, just calls like crazy. So I pretend that we're over like, you know, a time frame that'd be like really helpful to like a development officer like crap. Oh, I mean, it'd be probably kind of spooky to the donor to say something like, yeah, we talked last time uh, on your birthday, which was such and such, such and that would be like kind of stalkerish spooky, but that's what they want. Why don't you go and simulate another call to me, Daniel? Yep, from a different. Yep. Okay. Yep, just it. It works better in the <laughs> in the labs. It works real fast. <laughs> so now Fern Carson called me. So this will work for our engagement officer, officers and our development officers. But what we also noticed around the office is a lot of people for event registrations. I mean, they've been using it for other things than what we were thinking, especially the guy who does like parents and things like that. We're like, wow, we never we didn't anticipate that. We thought strictly people who are raising money. And now we have like, you know, the finance director with it installed because it could be a big donor calling them, asking them, I don't know, about their donation or whatever have you. Here's another cool thing that we uh, link to. Well, this person doesn't have any, but we keep contact reports and everybody in case you didn't know. So when Nick calls, we have information like, uh, let me see. Yep, she's got contact reports right there with dates and times and what it was about, and then links to like our CRM database to show more about that. Uh, what else am I forgetting here, Daniel? Probably under actions. Yeah, like you could mute someone and, you know, or mute. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a good feature. So if this person, you know, I didn't, I don't know, maybe I have a good relationship with them. I don't need to, you know, do this stuff. Or maybe it's Daniel and I, we work together. Daniel don't need to yeah. keep seeing this dossier on me. So I could click mute caller. We also have other stuff built in. Whoops, it was underneath actions where we can like toggle EC 500 on and off. We want Nick to basically make us a button where we can make, I don't know, a rest call so that we could turn on and off right now. Just like we're assuming you would click that from your cell phone. It would just dial the on EC 8, EC 500 on 
number or the EC500 off number. And it'd figure out from there. So now that I muted that person, Daniel, you want to yeah. send what, another? What was that person's contact? I think uh, it was Shelly Easton. Is that the six five seven? Can you get her number? Okay. Hope I got it right. Oh, that's for <laughs> Okay, yeah. So you would just get the quick like splash, like, hey, just in case you're wondering, you know, Shelly Easton Harding called me. Now that's good. We already have a good relationship where maybe Shelly and I we work together. So I don't need to be seeing this every time she calls. Actually, for employees, we want to make like a, a deep mute button. I don't even want it to splash inside my team to take up space if I figured out this is one of my colleagues. Stop telling me this, you know? I don't care what they gave to. They're not a prospect of mine. Something like that. And like I said, this card is, I remember our first like, you know, we were just happy to get the data to come back the first time. And then once we got the data to come back, I was like, well, we got to do something about styling this card. And I think even unbeknownst to us at the time, we're like adaptive cards. Like, what's that? Well, it's a Microsoft thing. <laughs> yeah. So a question just came through that. Does it have a dark mode? <laughs> yeah, it actually does. Yep. We played around with that. And, yeah. you know, Randy could change to dark mode if he wants right now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a live presentation. I've had enough hiccups today. <laughs> yeah, we could go to dark mode and it figures it out. And then whenever we do like an update, it pretty much automatically updates right through uh, Teams. And I got John messing with me. No guts, no glory. <laughs> I'm just going to be gutless today. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> So that's pretty much it, right, Daniel? Let me make sure. Sorry, guys, I got to do this in front of you. Let me get down that slide. Yep. So we'll bring up resources. Let me go ahead and just share that. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I went to slide one again. Hold on. I think I'm missing my multiple monitors at work about right now. <laughs> so these are definitely links you want to pay attention to. Like Daniel said, the adaptive card, like documentation, his uh, GitHub code samples of this, the whole payroll schedule thing um the api reference for talking back and forth for here also uh, teams has like a developer council and the scary thing is like daniel and i had it working before the whole like blow up yesterday we don't know what happened to it today but they have like you know a debug or uh yeah developer council similar to chrome very similar and then the azure uh, ad application service principle that one that's a good one right there. That's probably like an eight minute read. <laughs> Looks like Nick's bringing up dark mode here. So I'll just like cancel this share out. We can go to like questions. Hopefully you guys have some questions and hopefully we didn't miss something major. So we'll just open this up for Q and A and what questions do you have? Um, Randy, one thing uh, I saw on one of the initial screens in Azure, you had the option of, and you had it turned on, and they didn't talk about it, was pinning somebody. What's pinning somebody? Ah, uh, good one, Rick. That's like I do that to Daniel, so I know when he comes in, he'll just basically leave his chat conversation right at the top of my teams in the upper left. It will just stay pinned right up there. So that's what development officers do with the caller ID plus. 
so they don't have to search down through their chat conversations because the last time you got a call from a donor could have been, I don't know, five, ten days ago. It's a, a way to put it right at the top. Also, you made me think of another thing, Rick. We didn't show in that case because we had Daniel stimulate a phone call. There's also a way to look somebody up in the CRM. I could be like out to dinner. I see Rick Mason, I'm like Rick Mason, type it in there real quick and it'll bring me back that same dossier. Or we could be at an event and I can do the same thing and it's hitting our CRM data and it's fast. You need to have it so that you can just point uh, easily uh, your phone on your camera at somebody and go, who is that guy across the room? And it would just bring it up. <laughs> busy on that or maybe they already have that photo photo id business well actually we want to do that for an event rick so that um let's say for instance you go to an event and you're a development officer and you're waiting for daniel to come in and daniel is going to um check in using like the amazon show he's gonna go to that show and he's gonna say hey you know daniel's here and it's gonna take his picture and it's gonna also reach out to whoever is following you via our Crawl our ID Plus app. So as soon as you get there, it's gonna let you know, like, look, he's wearing like a black shirt and it says Star Wars in the front. That's cool. We're gonna store that in our CRM data. That's not creepy at all. <laughs> <laughs> we want. And, and notice he has to opt out of being creepy on any of us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well nick i hate to spoil it for you that's what they do over there in advancement they stalk people <laughs> i know i know well, at least he showed a demo that had fake data and not mark haas's information <laughs> right <laughs> that's funny because we we're using mark haas from the get-go like well this is a good guy right here we could use he has good data good giving history but then we're like yeah we better get some fake data we don't want nick you know spreading it all over the place <laughs> No, no Dan Gilbert or, you know, Magic Johnson info. We got it. We're just not going to show it. <laughs> <laughs> Their development officers can see it. We can't see it. We don't want to see it. Just to put it that way. I don't even want to see it. <laughs> Any other, like, questions? I know James is asking a lot of questions about, like, the back and forth and what's really happening. And the PowerPoint... I imagine Rick will put it on the website and then the recording of the video. Sorry, we had some like technical issues and we'll get this like polished. But I mean, once we got it set up and as you can see, the cold fusion part, we barely touched that. It doesn't have to be cold fusion. It could be anything, anything that sits on a web server. If it can, you know, respond, that's what it is. I mean, PHP, .NET, yeah. whatever you want. So if you like doing something else, it doesn't have to be cold fusion. It could have just been a straight HTML page. I mean. <laughs> uh, John asks, is there a place, uh, like a link you can give him where he can go learn how to create uh, Teams applets? Hmm. Daniel? Well, I think the best place to go find that will be Microsoft's, uh, I don't know, like documentations on Teams applications. And uh, because there are messaging extensions, tabs, bots, connectors, and other stuff. Yeah. So Do they have like a Teams, uh, you know, YouTube channel? Yes, there is. Mm. I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, they do send me messages all the time. And they talk about improvements to teams. They don't get into like building apps, but a lot of stuff about teams I didn't know. What's another uh, thing that we probably didn't cover was that when Daniel got down to the part where you could deploy an app, you can deploy that into the Microsoft App Store. So one of the Teams bots that I use quite a bit is the Trello Teams bot, because I'm usually in a meeting and somebody will mention something and I can just call Trello right from like the chat and say, make a card called, I don't know, stock donors better. <laughs> you know, detailed body. Well, we need to develop a Teams application that does blah, blah, blah. I don't have to even leave like the Teams like meeting at work. I can just do it all right from there. I'll go to my team, assign this 
you know, adapt or assign this Trello card to Daniel. I can do it all like from within teams. So I love that chat bot. Uh, James commented that he was interested in using this for a good way to post to a team's channel dedicated for alarm threshold notifications. And he thinks giving him all he needs to to go to implement it. Mm-hmm. That's cool because Daniel and I talked about that. It was like, let's think of like some simple thing we can build in front of everybody that they would be able to use. And that was one of the things we we're like, okay, I could do cold fusion to dot net to tell me like my hard drive is low in space on my web server or things, things about that web server. I'm at so much memory. So actually, mm-hmm. website goes down. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. <laughs> I mean, you could do well, something. Randy, you would never know what that uh, looks like, though, because it never goes down, right? <laughs> hey, actually, I didn't put it together, Nick. You know, we're in the middle of our uh, day of giving today, and I think we're up yeah. to, like, you know, 800 some thousand. I was like, I-, I didn't even put it together till last week. Like, that happens on the same day. We're doing the presentation the same day as this huge, like, campaign. Yeah, it's a good thing you didn't. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> didn't want to break anything and be like, uh, we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, James, if you want to share, like, for alerts, like, we were having a hard time thinking, like, what would we, what would a web developer want to know in that case? Hard drive, memory usage, number of threads in place at the time. I mean, latency. Like, How long does it take to process a page? Yeah. Or a still running query. So James, uh, I'm I actually have implemented uh, API calls or Microsoft Power Automate to send messages to uh, my users for like critical things like there's issues with the phone system or that type of stuff or you know we're getting to, we're getting a lot of calls coming in for you know one thing or another. We actually even have it actually uh, tied into our spam checker as well. So if we see a ton of calls from a certain phone number, it'll actually cause thresholds and all that type of stuff. But we're just using Microsoft Power Automate, which uh, formerly known as Microsoft Flow, to send very simple messages in a, in a channel. And the nice thing about that is you don't have to get the API key. You don't have to do all the developer setup and all that stuff. You can just go in there and just essentially it gives you a REST endpoint and you just tickle that endpoint and it can post something. But the problem with that is you can only do like a one-way conversation. I can only push data out. I can't really, you know, push and then consume data and do a lot more of the advanced stuff that uh, Randy's doing with his. Yeah, we were definitely, I mean, if you saw when I think uh, slide 21 where Daniel was like, um, these are different channel registrations and they showed like the Echo Show and like, or the Echo and Facebook. This is going to be like different if I can push this to so many different things. And it's just, you know, it's Jason. That's you break it, you boil all this down. It's just Jason, and you'll spend a bunch of time in like Azure setting up your uh, configurations. That pretty much where you're spending all your time. As far as whatever you're developing in PHP, Cold Fusion, whatever have you, that's going to be quick and easy for you. I mean, don't forget the $5 million phone system behind it, too, giving you all the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we give you guys credit on that one, Nick. I was like, can you just intercept phone calls? And you know, this funny story, the way this started was Nick used to send me, like, spoof calls. And my phone caller ID would say, like, call from Luana K. Simon. I'm like, the president's calling me? Like, hello? And it'd be Nick on the other line. And so then I started asking questions like, well, if you can spoof this, you can intercept it. You know, I mean, we just start having conversation. The first version of this started in email. And then the pandemic hit, and we're like, Daniel, you got about a month or two to deploy this in Teams. Let's get it cracking. <laughs> we got this thing. It works in email. It works in Slack. And it works in Teams. And actually, the Slack deployment was a lot, a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, James says his system tracks errors and if a certain type in a given category uh, happens within a configured number of times in a configured time period, it sends email notifications, then resets the alarm after X configured minutes. 
Yeah, I can see where this would be handy. And James, you'll get this up and running so fast. I mean, if you just follow the slides, it, you'll have this done within a day. It's just once you get the nuances and that one, uh, I think that one slide where I was like, this is very important that Daniel messed up one time. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel actually named the file that figured out what he did, the Daniel mess up file. Daniel messed this up because we had a bunch of people subscribe and Daniel, what was it? You deleted the channel configuration? Yeah. Which so I removed the team's channel and, you know, put it back, but then it literally destroyed all the conversation IDs that we had. It made all of them invalid, so <laughs> we couldn't <laughs> reach uh, users anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was messed up, Daniel. <laughs> so any other questions or comments, maybe from like Betsy, who works at Microsoft? I mean, where are they going as far as Teams? Because I'm starting to think Teams is more at the center of things than Office. Betsy's like, why you put me on the spot? <laughs> I had to get unmuted. <laughs> uh, as you know, there's only so much I can tell you what's, you know, what's public and what's what's not public. I can't share that. Um, so. Yeah. Well, from reading the tea leaves, yeah, that's their Cadillac right there. And everything, like, leaps into it. And we're trying to think of situations around the office as far as development officers because they don't really – Maybe you want these one-on-one uh, conversations, but maybe more so like in, I don't know, they're a more group conversation or something like that. It does make you think, though. Once you, like, crack the or scratch the surface, you're like, huh, how can I get this to work really well? And then you start talking to people like Nick and say, you know what, can you intercept phone calls? I'm wondering what else can be intercepted. You know, like James is talking about, like, uh, alarms and alerts. I'm like... There's other systems out there. What else could I intercept? <laughs> so also talking about the phone system, I can we can also text enable all your phone numbers and then you can have this thing send text messages uh, for, you know, officers or, you know, receive messages and do things based on that, too. Yeah. Teams does make the work, you know, the work in our office and collaboration just smooth. You know, Daniel and I haven't seen each other in a year. We're working on this power <laughs> together, right over Teams, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's well, changed the way I've worked. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine going back to not having it. Yeah. And that's another thing. If you're going to deploy an application, you know, if I deploy it for iOS and Android, I got to worry about their crazy nuances and changes. If I deploy this on Teams, pretty much Microsoft takes care of that. If Android wants to do something I don't agree with or whatever have you, they got it. I just make sure my app makes it to Teams and I'm done. And I didn't really check into because, you know, we're doing this for work. Like, I don't know how the payment goes. Like, if you were to deploy something out there to the Microsoft, uh, I don't know what they call it. I'll just say App Store. Here's Randy's Trello Teams app. Like, Trello was free. But we do pay Trello for the full-blown thing. I know Betsy's going to throw in there, you should use Planner. It kind of looks like Trello. <laughs> and actually, for the development officers, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, Nick called in to a development officer and it kind of created like a workflow or a Kanban card in Planner? You know, then, or maybe a list of things for Nick or somebody to do. You know, find out when Nick's birthday is. Uh, has he had the COVID shot? Um, get him tickets for the next Michigan game. You can just start building I, workflows. <laughs> I mean, I would imagine that, you know, development officer can just put something on my task list that says donate to MSU. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Have all these other systems reach around the background. Like, look, we haven't got any money from Nick in a while. Put that on the got to get money from him, you know? Yeah, yeah. Is bio data. So when I log into the bank account and uh, just, hey, by the way, we just pulled some money from you. <laughs> We're trying to help you, Nick. 
<laughs> so anybody else have questions? I missed something from John. John says, oh, yeah, John was ta- typing something here. Sorry. I was tasked with lunch and learn for my day job. We moved from Slack to Teams early 2020. Teams is uh, IMO, the most improved product as a uh, at MS for 2020. The shutdown is giving people new perspective on the value of remote. Yeah, that's true. I agree with that one. We had a hackathon earlier in March 2020. My project of choice for our team was doing internet inside of Teams. Hmm. I got outvoted. I bet they would have gone more votes now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> one click donations, Amazon style. See, John, see, he's on the right wavelength there. Just one click. Give us the money, Nick. We'll hold everything for you. Let's take it whenever you need it. <laughs> Why don't you show us how that works there? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you start. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, we'll, we'll start with Betsy. She's she's a good candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys have any other questions, I mean, we can hang around, chit chat. I just want to hold everybody else. I appreciate you guys coming out to check us out, see what we're doing. Um, anything you want to add to this, Nick? Because I think when we showed it to like ITS management, they were like, "What did you guys do? And why did you do this?" I don't think anybody knows. I don't know. Did anybody before coming to this presentation even know you could develop an app in Microsoft Teams? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, Betsy. You all. I mean. <laughs> I didn't. I was like, what the heck? I just knew we needed to start chatting with teams, and I don't care how we got it there. So that was eye-opening for us. And then once I figured out we could, and Rick will appreciate this, once I knew we could stay in within the five technologies that we know, I was like, let's do it. Because really it's just a bunch of like, you know, uh, JSON and configurations in their tool. I was like, I didn't have to do any like, you know, uh, PowerShell or anything like that. Oh, whiteboards. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's it's all about bringing these communication methods to the tools people are already using, you know, one of the keys that uh, that Randy had for us was, you know, he wants to, you know, he wanted this to work through people's cell phones, you know. So with us was, okay, make sure people publish their phone numbers, you know, their their campus phone number, and we'll do EC500. So essentially, it rings the cell phone pretty much on the first ring. But we can still intercept that data. We can still do transferring the calls. We can still do the muting. We can still do all that stuff, you know, right through that tool, essentially, because we still have a hook into that phone. You know, but it's really about, you know, we could have just as easily developed an application where they had a web page always up and they're waiting for that call to come in and does a screen pop or something like that. But nobody will use that because, you know, it's just not inside their regular workflow. So, you know, for us, the big key was making sure that, you know, targeting the tool they're already using. And, you know, there was a big push for everybody to use Microsoft Teams right around the same time, you know, that was one piece and then, you know, let's get this data interjected into it so that it, it's actually useful. Um, you know, we, like Randy said, we could have easily done this with Slack. We could have done this with, you know, well, whatever their tools that, you know, we've used before Jabber, I think you guys are using for a while too. But, you know, the fact that we're able to interject this into a tool they're already using and, you know, that tool becomes that much more useful and this becomes much more useful and all that, that's kind of, you know, the key with all this. You're welcome, Betsy. We were thinking about you. How do we yeah. gainfully employ, make teams like, you know, something they need? <laughs> She's like, yeah, okay, you did it for me. <laughs> so, Bob, anything you want to drop in there? I mean, I did, any situation you see you might be able to use this in? Um, I got to think about it a little bit, but that's really cool integration. And the amount of information you're able to bring to them is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it does have us scratching our head like, well, what else do we put in there? Our next move is probably toward events because a 
lot of people, you got to think about our clientele. They're all older. They use the phone. We've had requests of people to say, you know, well, if Nick emails me, can you have a card show up? I'm kind of thinking like, isn't that kind of like some anti-pattern or something like that? (laughs) Read your email. Or at worst case, Nick, they wanted to show up in their contact history. That either Nick tried to contact them via email on this date time or they tried to contact Nick on this date time. I was like, now that might make sense. (laughs) So if you use uh, Microsoft Flow, you can actually publish a flow for them. So you can actually get the uh, metadata of emails that come into them. So you can actually start tracking it that way, too. That's all I need is some more people read my email. (laughs) <laughs> oh we're already you're reading your email anyway so don't worry about that <laughs> right but bob maybe over there in your shop it might be you know like what james is talking about some alerts alarms some system things start meeting a certain threshold you want to be the first to know about it <laughs> yep yep absolutely hmm Gotcha. So, Rick, hopefully you learned something on this one. And I don't know, maybe you could deploy like a Microsoft Teams app, sell it at the App Store. I don't know what it would do. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I learned quite a bit because uh, Azure is like totally new to me. And uh, I I started using Teams through having our meetings on it. And I had very little exposure to what is there. and you can give me some ideas. I don't know if I can act on them right away, but. Rick's going to do something with farmers and teams yeah. and somehow it's going to let them know when their crops are doing, I don't know, flipping backwards. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, in time sensitive situations like what we were talking about, you got a development officer ringing your phone and you forgot <laughs> or don't know. Oh, that's a panic type situation. You know, time is of the essence right there. Because if you what's, answer the phone, you don't know who they are. Oh, they get pissed off. What was that? Nick? What's, I'll say what's really neat about this is, you know, that entire workflow happens from the time that the fir- the call rings to the time that they get the team's message is within that first ring. So it's as quick as caller ID showing up on somebody's phone, really. I mean, that's that's what's cool. Yeah, the thing is, you got an imbalance because these people, they know one development officer, whereas a development officer, I assume, deals with hundreds or thousands of alums. And you you want to be thought of as special, like he knows me. He, he you know, it, I'm special to him, so he knows everything about it. He remembers it. They don't think that that's almost impossible. I think it's really an empowerment of technology. And Maybe it'll get uh, MSU a little bit more money. You never know. So, Bob, you appreciate this. You know how when you call the help desk and we talk to uh, Matt Stahauer, how, you know, when you call there, they got to ask you, what is your net ID? Brown or a blah, blah, blah. You know who I am. I mean, <laughs> somehow make this work with teams or some type of interop. Get with Nick, you know, or, or HR. You call them. I would like, because let's say Nick could be calling on my behalf and say, you know what, Randy doesn't want life insurance anymore. (laughs) What qualifying questions do they even ask you? No, what I need to know is I need uh, to get on Randy's uh, policy. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Like I got a (laughs) account. And then step two. (laughs) (laughs) Whenever I talk to my Navy Federal it sends my phone like a code and they'll stop the conversation until I give them that code. The conversation is over. And it's like, they don't ask me all those questions. Like when I call it MSU credit union, well, do you have a loan with us? What color is your van? And I mean, this is still information somebody could get. <laughs> I like the whole code thing. I want donors to feel comfortable. I mean, Nick, you'll appreciate like when we put the cameras in the telemarketing room, so that when we call out to these older donors who are already getting scammed by everybody on the earth, you know what I mean? All these calls from supposedly Microsoft, you know, yeah. they want to feel like comforted, like that really is MSU. Okay, yeah. he takes care of me, puts MSU on there, but then you got some donors like, nope, and we'll tell them, go to this URL and you'll see me standing in the stadium. I'll be wearing the green shirt, waving my hand. That's to make this conversation happen. 
because so, that's skittish. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So we we have technologies to even turn that into a video call. If you're calling a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Because we just want you. Now, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> In time. Well, I mean, we're already watching Randy, so that's fine. It's it's already coming. It's already streaming in, but for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there needs to be a way, though, to validate, like, that call. Because my mom gets calls like crazy. Yeah. Uh-oh, Betsy has an idea. Nope. Mm. I'm just, no, I don't have an idea. Oh. John- <laughs> idea oh okay oh john's idea uh-huh. yeah we were trying to not develop a bunch of applications john i agree with you information overload like what would i call this thing like betsy's like call it hat rat just i feed in stuff about this and that and uh, yeah and i don't want it like you know some things i want at real time other things i'll just take the digest of it and I want to read an email about it, and yeah. I think we overuse email for alerts, and maybe this should be used. And then I'll be saying next year, we overuse this for alerts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where did I go? <laughs> well, it's good to have all you here, and I'll have to definitely brag to my girlfriend, like, Betsy Weber showed up. Can you believe this? <laughs> oh, my God, it's like a celebrity. <laughs> She's like, she'll be like, who? No. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that cool. Gotcha. But Randy That's Brown cool. showed up and Daniel presented. That was amazing. Yeah. I see. Daniel, just remember, you know, Betsy hits you up like Microsoft is looking for somebody like you, Daniel. You are happy <laughs> to be employed at MSU. Yeah. <laughs> we do have we do have internships and employment right. for new graduates <laughs> uh-huh. okay that's why she showed up okay <laughs> yep i'm just gonna forget to approve your pay daniel oh i'm sorry uh-huh. you, go to well, now you can't forget because it's telling you every day for uh, the entire <laughs> week <laughs> yeah i don't know if you have a problem with that nick i mean the bi-weeklies i'm like i get paid once a month the bi-weekly I'm like oh crap i gotta prove his time i got oh man yeah well, unfortunately as a as a supervisor manager i have to kind of live in ebs so i'm in there all the time anyway so the thing keeps on popping up because <laughs> it's not just that it's also the finance system it's the other stuff it's yeah well there's one for you nick it should be via teams where i can just feed it like my time Mm-hmm. Here's the date time I went off. I don't want to go through your crappy interface. It's shoot it over there, you know. They have a tool for that. It's called bookings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now there you go. Are you working for Betsy too? You're selling some more Microsoft products? Man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we were gonna try to use it in one of our projects. So I was like, yeah, we can use bookings. They got a lot of stuff here. Huh. Yeah. They just got to go through a configuration nightmare to get it to work. You got to read books to understand, like, how's all this crap buckled together? And then you have Daniel yeah. back blowing things up to figure out, like, well, don't do that again. Teams <laughs> is like a big old bucket of glue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> big old bucket of glue. <laughs> That's a good one. I agree uh-huh. with you. <laughs> you know, you screw else. up, you learn from it, but... Yeah. On a big scale, it's sometimes, you know, <laughs> not really helpful. Yeah. We did, a a of we did a presentation on caller ID to the development officers. We couldn't even keep up with the chat. They were, like, going crazy about it. And by the time we got the meeting over, because we were like, go to those three dots, click install. We had 100 installs before the meeting was over. We couldn't keep up with the, con- the chat. It was going, like, crazy. That's impressive. That's 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 product market fit, as we say in the startup business. Yeah, yeah. You need a moderator or two to help in chat. We had two of them, and they couldn't even keep up. It was just boom, boom, <laughs> boom, 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 like ah, we just froze. Like 
<laughs> so what you're saying is we should have done this about two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Remember, Randy, when I said you should do it this way? Yeah. And you're like, oh, let's just send it an email. That's all good. <laughs> right. well, Randy, I mean, what was the comparison? Before this, what did they have to do to get that same information? They would As opposed to small, just look at their phone. Oh, they would make small talk and maybe like feverishly typing in the background, trying to get your name spelled correctly, looking in the CRM database that logged them out for the like hundredth time that day, you know, and then it was it was craziness. So the development officers with good memory, they're okay. But if you're out in the road or something like that, you are screwed. And there's been so many like stories regarding like, you know, a donor calls like Rick who's like, I don't feel like I was handled professionally, you know, because the person didn't remember. Who the hell is Rick Mason? You know what I mean? Oh, that Rick Mason. Okay, I'm sorry. The guy with all the money, you know. I mean, so from from a development officer's standpoint, what's important is information at your fingertips, right in front of you. And that's what you gave them. Yep, yep. Yeah, so thank you, Microsoft, come along with Teams. And I mean, I don't know, it sounds weird. Thanks for a pandemic that forced people to, <laughs> you've got to think differently. We've been yelling about it. You should think differently. Now you have to think differently. Yeah, I'm worried about when people go back into the office actually and how yeah yeah we're all back the, right we're all the same right now right we're all working from home and remote what's that going to be like when you know half might be back in the office and half are still remote yeah i'm like adamant and arguing it pushing for like right now we got a little itty bitty zoom camera set up in a huge conference room you don't know who's talking it needs to be like, you know, the city council meetings, Nick, where they push a button in the camera. Like, oh, Nick's talking now. Oh, Randy's talking. You know, we have that, right? It needs to be set up in our building because, wait, hey. they did. Right before we left, I think they got like, was it 80 inch TVs against the wall that didn't have uh, uh, projectors? And I think yeah. they have a camera up there now. Hey, uh, get me a PO number. I'll get you whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what that's that? all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Vice uh, called like Owl or something like that that responds to who's talking and the camera focuses on them. So we use, so we actually have uh, enterprise grade stuff that we deploy like in classrooms and things like that. Uh, we have classes that have like for our medical school, we've got, you know, 70, 100, 500 kids in a room. And as soon as one person speaks up, the camera focuses right on them. And, like, it just goes around the room. I don't know, uh, like, Robert, if you've seen, like, the classroom over, like, a Conrad or some of those. But uh, they've got all those, you know, pre-set up and all the stuff's out there. You know, we have some of these things already at MSU. It's just, you know, it, it's not stuff that, you know, particularly in development, because you, you guys like to do your own AV installs as opposed to, you know, going to... Not the me. stuff that INC does and some of that stuff. But, you know, for our classrooms, we actually have some of the stuff already there. And they've actually put a lot more of it in since the pandemic started. When they originally thought that we were going to be like 50% in person, 50% online uh, this last fall, uh, they went to rush and put a bunch of technology in some of the larger classrooms. But, uh, but you know, for these, for these larger rooms and like for that type of stuff, like it, it's there. It just cost some money. Yeah. You guys just made uh, $830,000 so far. You can write a check for that, right? <laughs> we need to make a million. We've got to make it by midnight. <laughs> so you guys need to give. I'll send you the link. Make I don't know. I just got an email that said uh, Randy's going to go match up to $500 per donation <laughs> starting at 8.30 p.m. Wrong Randy Brown. It's got to be the other guy. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, no, it's this Randy's boss is going to make Randy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I try to think of like uh, Nick or Rick in law enforcement. They probably already have it. I'm pretty sure they got something just riding down the street reading license plate numbers. They do. <laughs> yeah. that was making, making news, something like that on teens, because it has to be a situation in my mind where time is of the essence. You know what I mean? You're driving down the road. 
I don't have time to punch in Nick's plate and then Rick's plate. But if you get one of these owl cameras, like what you're talking about, whoop, 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 you know, <laughs> that's kind of spooky, right? This is like definitely some stalker type stuff. But we want that same technology when development offs or donors go to an event. I wanted to be able to find them in that room of that sea of 500. I want that person to be able to go to their Teams app and say, where's Nick? Doo -doo. Over there. Thank uh, you. Th there are repo organizations, car repo people that, that have what they call repo cars, and that's all they do is drive around and scan license plates, and you can get access to their database for a fee, and you can say, where's Randy Brown? And they'll say, he's here during the day, and he's here at night. It's kind of oh. spooky. So at MSU, uh, you know that, like, well, the year before the pandemic happened, uh, they switched to uh, everything pay by plate, right? So we didn't, you know, we had like the movable tags and all that type of stuff and you registered your plates. Well, what they did uh, is they bought uh, the license plate scanners and they've got an app that essentially shows them which license plates are currently paid for. Mm -hmm. And they're driving through the parking lots and if they see a license plate that isn't currently registered, it tags it and then it automatically prints out a ticket. That's so they already not. got the <laughs> they already got the license plate scanners pretty much for everything, and that includes like you know the staff parking lots and all that type of stuff. They don't really care if you've got that sticker in your window; they just know if your car is actually registered or not. And uh, one advantage of that too, though, is you know a student will come in and say, "I forgot where I parked" or whatever, and they can go up and they actually got a map of where everybody currently is parked. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, that's that's spooky. Hmm. <laughs> That's about as bad as Rick's idea about just point the camera at a person. Okay, tell me about them. You know, that's the <laughs> same thing. <laughs> we got to get something first. like that in China right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, John, pay your ticket and we'll tell you where you parked. <laughs> <laughs> where we towed your car to. <laughs> we just moved it for you. <laughs> hmm. So I don't know. We've, been, we've been testing all that uh, video technology on Randy's phone a while already. It's all good. <laughs> He's been giving us all sorts of good data. <laughs> That's the fear. That's why I always put it in a lead box. <laughs> there uh -huh. we go. Nope, don't even know what I'm doing. You know, and then Betsy, she's so tight lipped. She won't tell us what their next move is. And like, I know she knows something. You know, in wrestling, we would say, let's go have a pillowcase party with that person. We'll beat it out of them. <laughs> Just become a Microsoft MVP. Just get that award, and then you'll hear all the new stuff before <laughs> everybody else does. Just that easy, right? <laughs> Just that easy. <laughs> Simple. Simple. Gotcha. <laughs> but, yeah, when we do the the amazon show so rick i'll probably do it on that one i mean that's gonna be stalkerish we started with the what was that thing right there on my our xbox 360 cam and that came out of a uh, nick did a presentation connecting a website to the xbox 360 cam is that right nick yep and how it has three cameras up there one that'll show you normal body heat all that stuff it doesn't show body heat it it's uh does a depth map so it'll actually do a 3D, uh, a, a view of a 3D map of a person. Actually, that's what I'm using as my webcam right now because I never actually bought a real webcam. So I've got the Xbox One hooked up here. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is I can change the, the camera source so it shows like the depth map as opposed to... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Nick disappeared. What is that? Oh, something Yeah, strange. looks like a like, ghost thing, you know? Right. Yeah, so much like cool technology out there. Of course, Rick, I think I mentioned to you, working, we're going to, in yeah. our lab, uh, you know, working with the Amazon Echo, because Microsoft has no device for this. But anyways, where you just make a donation to MSU. And it start, you know, prompting you, going yeah. back and forth, but using the same code that we use for processing online donations right now. <laughs> you know, I did a presentation on that uh, a year and a half ago on... Uh... Integrating that stuff in there, right? Yep, yep. 
So I get the ideas from there. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Nick's thinking about fundraising again. You know, but see, it's kind of like this whole idea. I mentioned this to management years ago, like four years ago. Oh, we don't need that. Pandemic hits. Oh, we need that thing. Well, no, no kidding. It's the same like making donations via that Echo or the Google Home. They're like, oh, we don't need to do that. You don't think you need to do it. Now, trust me, people are going to be going there or something. An opportunity is going to open. <laughs> I'll have to show you one day the, the cool integrations we're doing with uh, Contact Center AI. So uh, we're switching over all of our contact centers for the health clinics. So the 14 health clinics, so like uh, uh, sports medicine, uh, radiology, all those clinics that, that exist there, blood clotting, all, all those things. We're switching all them to be front loaded by a uh, essentially by a chatbot, essentially. So you call into the thing and it actually based on your sediment, based on so like, you know, how your voice is uh, based on what you ask for, how you ask things, all that stuff. It's going to route you to different people. So really, our point on this is to get the call, like every single call instead of it going to an RN, you know, probably 80% of the, of the questions we figured out can actually be answered by, you know, a person or can be answered by a script of some kind. So, uh, yeah, John, so if you say, hey, can I talk to a real person, you'll get to a real person. And that's, you know, but the but the thing is, like, you know, but if you ask, you know, you know, can I get my COVID shot, you know, it's going to give you that answer, you know, and that, you know, literally, like, you know, some of the front desks for some of these folks, like, they're answering the same question over and over and over again. So our hope is that we can start to, uh, you know, front load some of those things. But the nice thing is if it misunderstands you one time, it goes right to a person and it actually does a screen pop for them that shows them what attempts you actually uh, were trying, like what terms of information you actually had. So unlike some of the really bad, like, you know, I, I think of like the really bad chat bot or like the really bad IVRs, or, like calling to like a credit card company or like some of those things where you're like, you know, pay my bill or, you know, that type of stuff, you know, like those types of things. Um, you know, ours is really like, you know, the first time that it doesn't understand you, it's going right to a person. And then it actually tells that agent what information it thinks is understood and like what the sediment is and like a whole dashboard of information about that phone call. Wow. And also depending on the sediment of the person, we'll also go and match that sediment with somebody else. So if Randy's calling in and he's really frustrated, it's going to go to our more senior person who has a much nicer touch than, you know, a person when you call in and you're just giving very quick answers, very curt answers. It'll go to the person who's very good at uh, answering, like, just very quick answers and being done with it. So, There's a company so that's a uh, drift that does that kind of thing. Hmm? There's a company called Drift. OK, that does that kind of thing. And they're aiming at software as a service firms where you can't afford to main small company you can't afford to have somebody on chat all the time or you don't have agents you can afford and they'll take some of the easy questions for you and then hand it off um, yeah so that's that's pretty much what we're doing and we're doing ours completely with voice and text uh, initially but you know with us it's it's really you know so for example, uh, sports medicine has five RNs, so five highly trained people answering the phone, and 90% of the questions that they're that they're answering are, "Can I do the COVID test there?" No, and you know, "How can I pay my bill?" <laughs> Getting those off their off their list can actually get them so they can get better patient response for people actually in the room that are there to like see those people. You know, so that's really what we're trying to do because the money isn't there. You know, we don't have the room, the money, the space, any of that type of stuff to hire like 15 RNs just to answer all these questions. But at the same time, we don't want to lose customer service. So we don't want to stick them in like a IVR where, you know, you are waiting for very like one question or another question and things like that. But one of the things that we're also talking about doing, you know, bringing up more into the contact center AI stuff is also having it listen in on some of our common uh, uh, contact centers. So for example, uh, contact MSU, like the main phone number for the university, actually have it listen in. And as the person's as asking the question, the, they're talking to a live person, but it's actually listening in. And then it's actually doing suggestions for the person who is supposed to be giving that answer. So mm -hmm. think of it like 
you know, Alexa is uh, listening to you at that same time. Uh, and then it's giving answers like in real time on there, like it's doing like the, the Bing searches or whatever, the Google searches uh, for our, you know, Q&A system in real time. So really to give answers that much quicker as opposed to having a bunch of terms of information. And ultimately, what we want to have happen with some of that, too, is we want to have it build uh, help desks for or uh, knowledge bases for us, too. So if there's five or ten questions that keep on coming in there, automatically stick that into an, uh, in an FAQ that we can put on the website and have the system, based on what the agent is answering, like start to populate that information. That'd be sweet. That'd be that's, sweet. that's all stuff that, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're doing today. Uh, we're just building this out for these different contact center groups. And ours is all based off of uh, Google Dialogflow, if you've ever seen that product. No, but I do like uh, what Microsoft does as far as like a Teams recording, going back to what Betsy was saying about going back in the office. I love the transcript. I ain't got to look at a video. I just go search. Nick did not mention this. Let me just search for it real quick. And it's pretty damn accurate. So... Mm -hmm. I do love that about it, and I do. We've like played around with like the the Microsoft AI and you know sentiment and taking it like looking at a contact report and just breaking it out into like five bullet points and things like that. Saying what was this whole like long contact report really about? Bam, 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 bam. You know, <laughs> so that we can link it into like Call ID Plus, because the development officer can't sit there, you know, just reading this long book. <laughs> I need to get to the point. Well, last time Betsy called, she was talking about making that endowment for like a CBM. Let's get to the point here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she got, I got a funny anchor for you, Randy. Say again. How MSU can make money. You've heard of NFTs? NFT. You could buy, no. for example, uh, LeBron James Dunk, and you are the only person that owns it. You don't own the broadcast rights, but you're the only person that owns that game-winning dunk. It might be a you know twenty-second clip, gotcha. and MSU ought to do that. It makes a lot more sense than uh, MSU basketball brought to you by Quicken Loans or whatever they're calling it. No kidding. <laughs> There's some plays I wouldn't mind owning. Hmm. Well, and Rick, it's Rocket Mortgage, by the way. Okay. Yeah, it's MSU Spartans presented by Rocket Mortgage is our official name now. Randy's what? not wearing the current T-shirt. <laughs> you get a new T-shirt. <laughs> huh. Yeah, this is a new world. I'm trying to think of have Rick think of ways for me to make money. <laughs> um, actually, I got contacted uh, by somebody in Wisconsin that runs a bunch of uh, travel websites. And if anybody's interested, he's looking for somebody to port him from CF11 to CF20, is it CF21? Hmm. And do a little bit of development for him. If you or Nick or anybody, I know Nick is super busy, but John, I'll pass a name off if any of you are interested. Yeah, Betsy, you want a side job? <laughs> <laughs> it probably violates her NDA or something like that to touch some Adobe or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, moonlighting, no. I'm I'm so tired, so no, no extra job. <laughs> you can put your dad to work, right? Yes. He'll totally do that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's excited tomorrow we have the include 2021 conference so he oh, yeah. and i will be going to a conference together which is Ooh. really kind of fun sweet i'll put a link for that that's the um diversity and inclusion and allyship conference with some interesting speakers so right. that's what he's doing now in his retirement still learning still you know growing and yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's good. It is good. <laughs> gotcha. All right, guys. Well, I got to 
get upstairs and get some stuff done. It was good talking to you guys. I appreciate you coming and I'll try to come up with a more interesting topic. I know you guys are like show us the Amazon show. Uh, we don't want to hear about this boring teams crap. And we were going back and forth like, do we show demo the product first or do we talk about the boring stuff first? So it was back and forth. And Don's like, don't read off the slides, you know, get some more notes in there. You know, I don't know how Nick broke my presentation at slide 13, but it wouldn't move. I was like, what? sabotage. <laughs> Lucky number 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's okay we'll we'll clean it up in post okay <laughs> yeah well thank you very much randy I, I i found it interesting so yeah i think some people are here. It was great. New parts of it so yeah thank you um, daniel thank you randy yep. this youtube channel business uh we uh i think 